Chapter Twelve of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Twelve. I threw up my curtain next morning to find London settling down into a sea of fog. Already the Thames was wholly hidden, and the water side of the embankment showed only faint twinkling lights, just on the point of complete extinguishment. The caped policeman, the hurrying butcher's boy, the laborers and the charwomen passing through the garden below, had all completely lost their individuality, and became, in place of common London types, misty twentieth-century Niobes but dismal though it was without my spirits were cheerful enough within as i started down to meet tom and dorothy we were half through breakfast when hammerly's card was brought in to be followed a few moments later by the man himself i looked with delighted interest at the involuntary start that he gave when he met dorothy how i wish i might rightly describe her as she stood there lighting by her very presence the grey interior of the dining-room shrouded as it was by the london particular everything else was gloom save in the circle where dorothy gave the radiance of her presence hammerly's silent tribute was no more than she exacted from all who met her again and again i marvelled at my audacity in believing i might have this incarnation of youth of power and beauty for my own such thoughts raced through my head as i sat watching the swift interchange of question and answer between tom dorothy and hammerly in response to their inquiries hammerly related the story he had told me the day before and as he ended asked what are you going to do next how are you planning to use your man swenton dorothy answered for tom and myself we are going straight to dr heidenmuller's laboratory taking swenton along i want to have the whole scene before my eyes to see what can be made out of it we should be very glad to have you come with us mr hammerly tom bent towards me with a look of mock anguish on his brow how i had hoped for a peaceful sunday morning he said in a low aside and now we've got to plunge out into a nasty fog chase all over this benighted city never mind i might have known i never can have my own way despite his plaint tom was the first one ready as clothed in raincoat and slouch hat our little party gathered under the shelter of the glass awning inside the court the massive dignity of the carriage porter shrouded in a white glistening rubber coat loomed bulkier than ever as with an elephantine grace he whistled shrilly twice out of a dim background two hansoms dashed into the circle of light where the arcs of the entrance fought bravely against the encroaching fog i'm going with mr hammerly said tom you take dorothy and the other hansom jim and drive straight we'll pick up swenton on the way give the address will you hammerly old jewelry third alley this side of gresham street said hammerly and the cabbies nodded dorothy stepped lightly in before i could lend my aid i followed the porter closed the curtaining doors pulled up the window and we were off embarked on a sea of fog as i looked out i thought i saw tom speaking to our driver but i could not be sure old jewelry said dorothy dreamily how delightfully dickinsonian i haven't an idea where it can be and i don't want to know it's much more fun plunging off into an unknown world of adventure in the good ship handsome cab i happened to have a strong idea where old jewelry was but some guardian angel kept me from speaking never before had i possessed all that was precious to me in life in the small capacity of a handsome cab outside passed slowly by a dim neutral city into which street lamps cast pointed lines of light in a vain endeavor to pierce the gloom where ghosts appearing suddenly under our horses feet disappeared quite as suddenly into the blanketing darkness and where now and then a motor-bus came looming past us like some high pooped caravel of spain now and again we stopped now and again we crept at a foot-pace through what seemed at one and the same time an eternity of joy and a fleeting moment of happiness dorothy lay back against the cushioned corner taking in the experience to the utmost we spoke but seldom i proffered no suggestions it was enough for me to sit beside her to know the rough cloth of her tweed ulster touched my hand to feel through every inmost fibre of my being her dear and sweet proximity on and on we travelled till at length i came to the sudden realization that according to all my impressions we should have been at our destination long before i looked out carefully for the first time 
the fog was as dense as ever i knew nothing of my whereabouts saying no word to dorothy i kept on trying to pierce the wall of cloud as a hundred questions began to spring up in my brain was there something queer in this was the driver lost or was he purposely taking us in some dangerous direction it did not matter anyway as i looked at dorothy i knew i could protect her against a thousand perils and i felt a warm glow of power of courage springing within my soul just then i saw some arc lights ahead and i peered yet more carefully under them the fog seemed less dense and when a brass plate showed i scanned it eagerly charter house i could read no more but that told me where i was in charterhouse square beyond smithfield almost to clerkenwell road we had gone far out of our way while i had been dreaming i threw up the driver's door you must be out of your way i cried i couldn't do better sir came the answer i had to come round and i made it straight for old jewry sir perhaps there was a note of laughter in the man's voice certainly there was nothing sinister i recalled the glimpse i had caught of tom beside the cab at the savoy and my qualms seizing i inwardly blessed that mischievous spirit dorothy looked up as i spoke is it all right jim she asked it's perfectly all right i answered and she fell back into her happy meditation while i inwardly made still more remarks on her ingenious brother silent and happy we went on my mind quite at rest now and not in the least anxious to come to the inn the cab stopped and the little door at the top opened with a click this is the place sir i jumped out and looked around no cab in sight well i said to dorothy here's a pretty go nobody in sight and i don't know which is the house without a word dorothy leaned forward and whistled a single bar out of the fog came the notes repeated and a moment later across the street came tom oh you've reached here finally have you said he he traced sarcastically i thought you'd never arrive i couldn't imagine what kept you as he spoke i heard a sort of choked gasp from the top of the hansom but fortunately dorothy's suspicions were not aroused it hasn't seemed so very long she answered simply to which tom responded oh really hasn't it as he took her arm to lead her across the street he called back to our cabby as we left drive forward a little and you'll find a sort of shelter where you can wait the other cab's there right sir came the reply and we heard the slow movement of his disappearing wheels as we three were left in the ocean of fog swenton's hunting up the caretaker said tom hammerly and i have been waiting for him to come back the old rooms are locked up tight we found hammerly in a vestibule where a single glass lamp flickered and as we waited we fell into talking in low tones the mist seemed to bring our voices to a minor key perhaps ten minutes had passed when the door opened and swenton entered accompanied by a man in a coarse ticking apron this is the caretaker sir he began bowing to dorothy and me he refused to let me in to get my things says the laboratory was left after dr heidenmuller's death to another chemist a gentleman who bought all the doctor's stuff from the heirs he was there off and on for a little while but he went away quite a long time ago went one night suddenly and never came back this man says the agents won't allow anybody in i brought him here so you could talk to him if you wished the caretaker stood silent and sullen as swenton spoke his hands deep in the front pockets of his apron i do want to speak with him said tom briefly come here and he led the way apart the caretaker following a moment's conversation was broken only by a golden clink accompanied by the jingle of keys after which the caretaker disappeared and tom turned back to us i have here he said mysteriously a bunch of keys which i strangely found on the floor in the rear of this hall suppose we ascend to the top floor and see if they will work there dorothy's face was clouded as tom came up to the spot where we were standing a little apart hammerly and swenton had already started up the stairs i'm not sure that you are doing right in this tom said dorothy swiftly in a low voice i don't like to bribe a servant to let us into a place where we don't belong tom's face became serious in a minute i don't like it either dorothy he answered gravely but i'm going to do it do you remember the little german middy lying down at the bottom as long as the man who is trying to stop all war is at large there are thousands of men in hourly peril i honestly believe we are the only ones who can run the man down i am convinced we shall be wholly justified in such action dorothy stood for a moment in silent thought i think you're right tom 
she said quietly. In this case, I hope and believe the end will justify the means. We must find the man. Go ahead. Stumbling through the darkness, we reached the top, where the flame of a match showed a strong oak door with two Yale locks upon it. Tom had the keys in immediately and threw the door open. Once within, Swinton passed with a custom step to the wall, turned a switch, and incandescence lighted the whole place. We were in a sort of anteroom, with desks and chairs. The outer office, said Swinton, briefly. We passed to an inner door. The main laboratory, remarked Swinton. This was similar to any other laboratory. A good-sized motor generator in one corner, covered by a rubber sheet. A couple of tile-top tables. A set of shelves on one side, filled with labeled reagent bottles. A set of glass cases, supported on a base filled with drawers, on the other. In the cabinets were glassware and apparatus of various sorts. Tom started for the case, but Dorothy laid a restraining hand on his arm. Wait till we have seen it all. Then we'll go over the whole, piece by piece. Tom nodded, and we went on. There were three doors on the opposite side of the wall. Swinton passed to the first and opened it. The storeroom, he explained. Within were wooden cases of glassware, large carboys of acid, glass tubing on racks, and wire on spools. In one corner was apparently a hospital for broken or disused pieces of apparatus. We turned from this to the second door. The balance room, said Swinton, as they threw open the portal. Three balances in polished wood and shining glass met our eyes. There was nothing else in the room. Swinton opened a third door. The spectroscope room, he said. Beyond is the doctor's private laboratory. A big piece of apparatus on the table was covered with a green cloth. Beyond was a wooden door. Despite myself, I felt a queer, nervous tremor pass over my frame as I looked at the commonplace wooden panels, behind which Dr. Heidenmuller had sat, dead, killed by the same mysterious power which had slain the men I had seen lying quietly at the bottom of Portsmouth Harbor. Tom and Hammerley were as keen as hounds on a scent. Swinton, interested, but more indifferent. Dorothy, pale, her eyes glittering with excitement. Hammerly reached the door first, tried it, and swung it back. The incandescent had not been turned on in the spectroscope room, and the only light which entered was the golden lane, which came through from the main laboratory. It seemed like a strange setting. The light fell on a heavy wooden table and a couple of Windsor chairs. The rest was but faintly outlined. A moment's pause on the threshold, as if we expected to meet some horror, we knew not what, and then we rushed in together. There was nothing to be seen. Wood-panelled walls, windows sealed by wooden shutters, the wooden table and the two wooden chairs. That was all. We stood there silent until Tom broke the quiet. Nothing to do but to Sherlock Holmes it, he said. We have all later on this thing down. Swinton, there's a piece of apparatus here that I need. The doctor may never have had it outside his room as a whole, yet we may find traces of it in the laboratory or the storeroom. Are you willing to help us hunt? I should be the most ungrateful man living, sir, if I were not, said Swinton, earnestly. I owe my wife's life to you and Miss Haldane, he glanced at Dorothy. So that's where you've been the last two mornings, I whispered to her as Tom went on. I found them just coming out of great distress she answered simply i am so glad i was able to help now cried tom let's sit down to another council of war come out into the outer laboratory and we'll talk it over the drawn shades the bright gleam of the laboratory lamps reflected back from polished tile and cabinet door gave a distinctly cheerful aspect to the scene as we settled down i have been thinking this matter over carefully for some time began hammerly in his rather careful tones once we were seated and if you do not object i should like to present my theories go right ahead said tom hamley went on somewhat thoughtfully i think you're wrong in saying we ought to follow the methods of sherlock holmes we ought rather to follow dupin poe's detective the man who preceded sherlock holmes try to reason out what the doctor would have had on hand with regard to the power and where he would have had it try to analyze the action of his brain rather than hunt for minute data let's see what we know about dr heidenmuller he was a german of the most typical student type that means he would never do anything without putting it down on paper he had every desire to keep what he was doing from those around him that is evident from the fact that swenton never knew anything about the interior of this room if the doctor made notes as i believe he must have done 
he would have wanted them within reach so he must have had them in this room he was a brilliant scientist therefore he would not by preference have used any of the ordinary methods of concealment his notes and apparatus were likely to take up a comparatively large amount of space so that we are impelled to the definite conclusion that there is a concealed closet somewhere in that inner chamber if we could take the time to remove the whole of the walls and could get permission to do so we could i believe find the hiding place but that would involve time expense and running down the people who at present control the place and own the apparatus i strongly question whether that would be worth while no said tom i don't believe it would if there were any chance of the man who has hired this place being the man we are after i'd say go for him at any cost but i don't believe there's one chance in a thousand that it is he's too sharp to stay around where dr heidenmuller died under such peculiar circumstances i agree to that said hammerly and i too i chimed in dorothy said nothing but as i watched her i saw the rose of her cheeks growing deeper and that peculiar change in her eye that showed she had already leapt beyond the reasoning of the others and grasped the answer by intuition one question first she began mr swinton did the doctor leave the door to the spectroscope room open when he went into his private room no answered swinton slowly he would go into the spectroscope room lock that door and then you could hear the inner door open and shut sometimes he would not come out again but i have often heard him come out into the anteroom about three or four minutes after he went in stay there for a minute or two then go in again and come out once more after that he would be shut up there for hours together that settles it cried dorothy i'm sure i know how he opened his secret closet or closets you remember the insulated wire covering they found when they came in after the doctor's death we all nodded eagerly that was the winding of an electromagnet he attached it to the long flexible cord of that incandescent light socket in the anteroom took it in opened his closets brought it out again and went back see if you can find an electromagnet in the cases or the storeroom and we'll open things up scarcely were the words out of her mouth before swinton had hurried to a drawer and pulled out three small electromagnets all of the same size here are the only ones i know of in the laboratory he exclaimed i can connect one of them with the flexible cord in a minute we shall want more light though if one of you gentlemen will get another connector and fix it to a socket i'll fit the magnet you'll find some connectors for that size socket in the storeroom i'm sure with four practised hands at work it was scarce ten minutes before an incandescent stood on the table in the inner room while we had an electric magnet connected to a long flexible cord which brought current from an incandescent light socket in the next room dorothy stood in the centre once more in command i believe it's under one of those pegs she said see what's under them round and round the room we went pulling at every peg that joined the seal walls under each was a nail tom picked up one of the pegs as we drew it forth humph he cried insulated by chyma that explains why the nails were left what a careful job this was anyway hammerly and swinton nodded i started to ask what chyma was but i was pulling on a particularly refractory peg just then and let it go the word stuck fast in my memory however it was the same one i had seen in tom's book on our journey up from portsmouth as each peg came out a little electromagnet was brought up to the hole and its action watched not a nail stirred we had gone around three sides of the room when tom called out this peg came easily bring over the magnet before i could bring the magnet within an inch of the hole the nail within sprang out and attached itself to the magnet just as a needle springs up and clings to the horseshoe magnet of a child as it sprung the whole panel four feet high and three feet across opened on easy hinges and swung outward showing a small inner door tom gave a long low whistle right again sister he remarked what should we do without you the stout oak door strong as it was proved no obstacle to our attack and readily swung outward stooping we peered within empty shelves on one side a row of drawers on the other one by one we drew the drawers from their places every one was empty from top to bottom the recesses we searched but without avail finally we straightened up with blank faces 
there must have been something here said dorothy slowly hang it ejaculated tom i know there was if you want to know my real opinion there has been somebody here ahead of us i don't believe we'll find a thing we did not and the last inspection over we were ready to take our leave when tom broke in one last thing he said i want to see how that incandescent light in the ceiling can be connected without outside metal that reflector by the way looks like clear glass but it must have some reflecting power he jumped lightly to a chair thence to the table and turned to look through the clear glass of the big hemispherical shade which had guarded the incandescent in the ceiling oh i say he exclaimed here's a most extraordinary thing everything seen through this is bent double here's the biggest refraction i ever saw can it be the glass or something inside of it this thing is hermetically sealed above do you know i believe we've got one solution of the mystery here we all stood looking eagerly up at him as he gazed through the globe End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the man who ended war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the man who ended war by hollis godfrey chapter thirteen with a quick spring dorothy was the first on a chair and then on the table beside her brother she bent to inspect the crystal hemisphere, looked at it from various points, and then both of them began examining the construction of the lampshade. "'It's hermetically sealed above?' said Tom, finally, a note of inquiry in his voice. "'It seems to be,' answered Dorothy briefly. "'Tom, jump down, will you, and let Mr. Hammerley come up here. Jim, will you and Mr. Swinton see if you can find another lampshade like this in the storeroom?' we returned from our errand bearing a duplicate of the shade which we had found on a shelf dorothy who by this time had come down from the table where hammerly and tom still stood took the shade from my hands and held it to the light this shade is nothing but ordinary glass there's nothing unusual about it she exclaimed the effect of the shade up there must be due to a gas inside as tom and hammerly leapt from the table to inspect the shade i seized the opportunity to ascend and mounting gazed through the hemispherical glass a strange world met my eyes everything seen through the glass was bent around at extraordinary angles tom's legs seen below the shade were perfectly natural and upright but his torso seen through the shade was bent like the body of a japanese contortionist engaged in extremist posturing the straight line of the door casing beyond was broken short off where the line of the shade intersected it and the top of the casing appeared in a wholly different place as i gazed i struggled to think what common everyday thing acted in much the same way eureka <laughs> i had it why whatever is inside this globe bends everything seen through it something as a spoon is bent in a glass of water or an oar in a pond i cried hammerly looked up that's about right orrington or better yet you could say it bends the things you see as the hot gases rising from a chimney bend everything behind them into wavy lines haven't you ever watched the queer waviness that shows in a wintry atmosphere above chimneys when you look over them many a time i replied well it's just the same type of thing we have here when you look across a chimney where hot gases from a fire are coming off you are looking from air through lighter gases for such hot gases are lighter than cold air to cold air again that extreme bending of light rays that we call refraction is the reason why we hope we have a new gas if we can test the gas to find out what it is it ought to be a big lift in finding out what really happened i said as i descended from the table that won't be hard at all interrupted dorothy we'll test it with the spectroscope in the next room here comes tom now with the apparatus to catch and confine the gas with glass tubes and air pumps with platinum and flame they strove for half an hour tom hammerly and swinton together dorothy threw in a quiet word of suggestion now and then but the most of the time she stood back with me this was a matter for experts and left nothing for me to do as we waited i asked dorothy two questions where do you think the gas came from has it been here since Haydn Mueller's death i think it must have been answered dorothy if as i imagine we have an unknown gas here it is probably one of the products left behind from the metal destroyed by the terrific force used by the man when the substance that gave the force energy or whatever you call it 
escaped through the broken valve of the cigarette case this gas was formed from the changed metal and as it was lighter than the air some of it rose and filled the shade the rest floated upward and out through some crevice when the man destroyed the alaska or any of the other vessels the same thing probably occurred the metal of the ship changed to a gas which floated up into the air with extreme rapidity the gas must be to air as oil is to water that is it can't diffuse or mix with it any more than oil can mix with water otherwise it wouldn't have stayed all these months in that lampshade just then tom came towards us with a glass tube a foot long and an inch or two wide in his hand in each end was sealed a bit of silvery metal platinum i said as i looked at them yes said tom laughing mrs rosnowski taught you to know platinum when you see it just look through this he held the tube before us and the same magic bending of the lines showed as we gazed the tube was filled with a gas that i had seen in the shade above that's as pretty a piece of work as i ever did said tom approvingly transferred it without allowing practically a particle of air to get in now we're ready to try the current on it and then the spectroscope rembrandt might well have painted the picture that i beheld to hang beside the lesson in anatomy that dominates the old museum at the hague a striking group of four bent above the shining tubes and polished mountings of the spectroscope tom eager with his fine lean face showing the highest power of receptivity to new ideas mouth mobile but firm with an ever-present tendency towards an upward lift of the corners hammerly careful thoughtful scholar in our college slang a little of a grind type extremely bald his glasses perched judicially on his rather prominent nose his face showing the lines of deep and strong thought swenton faithful and efficient follower a man who would always be led would never spring by any conceivable chance from the narrow channels where his lot had chained him dorothy maxima et otma now commanding by reason of her swift flying intellect now yielding to her dreams as she had an hour or two ago in the handsome cab and when yielding most womanly most thoroughly feminine of her sex faceted like a diamond she shone upon the world through every facet and every line plane and angle showed a new beauty a new grace the four stood eagerly intent upon the little tube before them as they connected it with a huge coil which stood near that done everything was ready to throw the switch which would send the electric current leaping from one platinum pole to another penetrating the gas in the tube heating it changing its action forcing it to submit to the current's tremendous force all ready asked tom as he straightened up from the last adjustment swenton you turn off the lights and i'll put on the current here as the lights went out we heard the sound of the throwing of the switch dorothy stepped back by me a low buzz grew swiftly in intensity and then a simultaneous cry broke from us all within the tube a soft blue came slowly from out of the dark the blue of early dawn on quiet waters as we gazed it turned darker more brilliant now it was the deep steel blue of the biting autumn day now the deep blue black of velvet tropic night every change every hue was lighted by the rarest and most exquisite effulgence man could conceive no glory bound to earth it seemed rather an unearthly brilliancy perhaps such radiance as led the three kings gaspar melchior and balthazar to the manger where the young child lay it awed us all that is beyond anything i ever saw said hammerly at length breaking the silence i have observed every known gas under the influence of current but never anything like this nor i said tom but there may be no time to spare let's try it with the spectroscope as tom and dorothy bent over the instrument i asked hammerly what do you expect to find from the spectroscope what does it do it breaks down light answered hammerly by means of a prism as a prismatic chandelier or a prismatic glass thermometer throws the spectrum of sunbeam on the floor breaking the white light of the sun into a shifting mass of color that changes from red through orange and green to violet every different glowing gas gives off a slightly different light we can tell by the spectroscope whether the light from this gas is the same as any we have known before or whether it is different if the light waves sent out are unlike any recognized before we can be sure we have a new gas tom was turning a screw 
with his eye glued to a small telescope. Change that tube a bit to the right, Hammerly, he said, and it was changed. Now a bit higher. No, not, not so high. A bit lower now. There you are. He gazed long and intently, then rose, motioning Hammerly in silence to take his place. Dorothy followed Hammerly, and Swinton followed her. I ended, but I could distinguish nothing save some lines crossing a scale placed within the tube. As I rose from the stool, Tom reached up to throw on the lights. As he faced around, Hammerly met him with outstretched hand. "'It is only given to a handful of scientists in a century,' he said, "'to find a new element, to discover one of those units from which the world is made. I believe you have done it this afternoon.' "'It is a new elementary gas,' said Dorothy. "'You found it, Tom, when you climbed the table.' "'Much good it will do me, so far as that goes,' remarked Tom. "'So far as we know, all there is of it in the world is in this tube. "'I don't know how to produce any more, and I can't publish anything about it, "'for it would interfere with our search for the man.' "'You have no right to say it's no use,' said Dorothy. "'Again and again as we have gone on, the slightest unexpected things have come to mean the most. "'I believe this tube of unknown gas may be an important link in the chain.' all right said tom just as you say you can be sure i wasn't going to throw it into the wastebasket while swinton cleared away the rest of us went into the wooden room hammerly passed across and opened one of the wooden shutters the fog is lifting he said we looked out and saw that the other side of the street was gradually becoming visible dorothy seated herself by the window and we joined her i don't know that there could be a better time i began than right here and now to find out just where we are for my part i want to understand the relation between the new gas and all that has gone before if we bring all our information together won't there be a better chance to get a line on our next move we have two things in our hands said tom thoughtfully this tube of gas here and the cigarette case we know that the ships really disappeared because jim has been to the bottom of portsmouth harbor and seen the men that lie there we know by the same token that this force kills by a sort of paralysis, every man whom it attacks. Oh, that reminds me, he exclaimed, checking himself. Let me see that cigarette case again, if you will, Hammerly. The case, once in his hand, he looked it over with minute care. Insulated with the paraffin by Kaima, don't you think? He asked Dorothy. After a brief inspection, she also nodded. That's Kaima, all right. Never mind Kaima now, whatever it is, I said. Let's go on with the business. What else do we know? Hammerly took up the tale. We know to a reasonable certainty that Dr. Heidmuller was the first man who found the source of this power, and that he died when it accidentally was let loose. We know that some of this substance, probably in powder form like radium, was kept in the leather cigarette case, insulated by paraffin and chyma. He paused. We know, went on Dorothy, that when the man who was trying to stop all war uses this force, a tremendous amount of radioactivity energy is generated, enough to affect reflectoscopes half around the world. We know there is something which is even more than all those, I broke in. We know there is a man who is slaughtering men by the hundreds in pursuit of his ideal, and that it is our business in more ways than one to run him down. How will the data we have on hand enable us to do that? As I spoke, Dorothy was sitting looking meditatively out of the window. The fog had lifted a little more. Amerly straightened in his chair. Miss Haldane, he said. If you look straight across the street from where you are sitting, you can see the spot from which the sign fell on the day that Dr. Heidenmuller died. Dorothy turned in her chair, and we all crowded about her. Hammerly pointed across the road. There, against the brick wall of an old house, blackened by the smoke of many sooty years, two small rectangles showed in light relief against the surrounding darkness. The sight of those spots, where the supports to the sign had once stood, brought the whole horror of it home to me more forcibly than anything else. The very smallness, the homeliness of the thing drove it in. The accumulated effects of the charged electroscopes, of the wave-measuring machine, of the bodies on the ocean's floor, of Dr. Heidenmuller's death, and of the gas we had just found, rose to their very crest in those small light gray spots, less sullied than the rest of the wall. And there is where the wooden sign fell down, and its iron supports disappeared, said Tom reflectively. Jove, I'd like to have seen it happen. If anybody had seen it, though, he wouldn't have believed his eyes. We were still standing, peering out through the rising mist, when Dorothy spoke out excitedly. That's the next clue. 
there's nothing else that would do so well the hunt for disappearing iron what good will that do said tom we know where iron has disappeared and we've run everything down as far as we could it isn't like that heidenmuller or the man went around shooting off signs for fun of course not answered dorothy impatiently but don't you see the man must have had a laboratory or lodgings anyway somewhere in london if he got his data and his power from dr heidenmuller here when dr heidenmuller let his discovery get away from him it killed him and caused all the metal which it reached to disappear now the man hasn't been killed by his weapon unless it happened very recently but it's perfectly possible that he might have allowed some of his magic substance to escape without injury to himself if that happened it would destroy any metal at hand if we could find some place where iron disappeared we might get a direct clue to the whereabouts of the man it's worth trying anyway i'm sure it is i cried tom you old doubter speak up and admit dorothy knows twice as much about it as you and i put together i guess not said tom firmly there may be something in it if we could get track of everything that bore on disappearing iron london over but he went on talk about a needle in a haystack you went up against a hard enough proposition in running down heidenmuller's laboratory here but this new deal is far worse you can't advertise no i don't see how you can remarked dorothy a trifle discouraged oh this thing's easy enough i broke in i wish everything was as simple inside of two days i'll have all the information that london holds with regard to disappearing iron how can you get it cried the three in unison End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter 14. By using the device which ministers at the same time to the vanity and the necessity of man, the clipping barrel, I replied we will subscribe to that distributor of special information and get every clipping for the last six months that bears upon falling blinds signs lost or stolen iron they can ransack the files for us and send us the result of their labor just the trick cried tom enthusiastically we'll go straight to work on it now let's get out of here bearing our precious tube of gas we started back leaving swenton to close the laboratory and follow later no such delightful wandering was provided for our return as for our coming all too soon we were back at the savoy with our day's labor over ready to follow the new trail wherever it might lead us two mornings after the eventful day in heidenmuller's laboratory i knocked at dorothy's door and entered to find the broad table of her sunny parlor covered with piles of neat clippings each with a docketed slip at the top the clipping bureau had exceeded my best hopes and had turned in the information in quantities tom and dorothy were bending over the pile sorting them as the maid ushered me in if you hadn't told them to sort these things at their office we should have been swamped beyond all hope of salvation grumbled tom as he stood with a bundle of clippings between every finger of both hands where are the westminster shutters dorothy here they are said dorothy now i want the chelsea signs it's just like solitaire the signs are my cards blinds go to tom and you can take stolen iron that's stolen iron that heap of packets over there on the other side of the table i sat down to my task hour after hour passed and we sorted read and rejected now and then a clipping would go aside for further reference occasionally a packet or a single slip would pass from one to another lunch took an hour but after lunch we turned again to our labors and afternoon tea-time came and went before we were done at length tom rose and gave a mighty yawn eight that look good he remarked eight from me i echoed ten chimed in dorothy that's not half bad said tom reflectively there were hundreds of clippings there and we've brought them down pretty low all things considered we three dined alone that night and when the coffee came on tom reached into his pocket and pulled out a long envelope with the twenty-six clippings which comes first he asked signs or blinds or stolen iron match you to decide i answered and pulled out a sovereign i'll take signs you take shutters tom won shutters against stolen iron then dorothy cried i'll match you this time said tom 
we matched again and again tom won then one of my eight shutters is the trump card exclaimed tom i'll number them one to eight and then pass the bunch around so we can each pick the two that look like winners then i'll pass the signs to pick a second choice dorothy in her gray gown of shimmering silk her face flushed with the excitement of the decision pored over the little list carefully for some minutes before she returned them to tom who passed them on to me remarking briefly i made up my mind when i picked the eight out of the bunch Three times over I read the list, which told of blinds dropping on still days and injuring passers-by. Tom had eliminated the accounts which told of signs and shutters blown off in gales. It might easily happen that a gale and the escape of the destructive power would occur simultaneously, but the unusual was the thing we were after. There, most of all, would lie the clue we sought. At last I came to a decision and looked up. One in the first lot and three in the second, I said one in three echoed dorothy the same said tom great thing to be unanimous read em aloud jim i obeyed a shutter which fell from a house on gower street just off tottenham court road struck a passing laborer yesterday morning and inflicted injuries of so grave a character that he was immediately removed in an unconscious condition to the hospital his identity has not yet been established that's number one a large sign which fell from a second story at Chelsea yesterday broke in pieces on the sidewalk beneath, but fortunately inflicted no serious injury. That's number three. Which do we choose? Both of those look rather good to me, answered Tom, but I think the one near Tottenham Court Road looks best. The chances of finding the man's laboratory would be greater in Bloomsbury than further out. Dorothy nodded her approval. All right, I said as we rose. The Corps will move upon Bloomsbury at dawn, under command of General Dorothy Haldane. Dawn being interpreted as 9.30, we will, answered Dorothy, laughing. The next morning found us bowling along towards our destination, discussing, meanwhile, the method of attack. Leave it to inspiration, I said, as we drew up at the door. Let me play a lone hand on this. Luck was with me. There was a sign of lodgings in the window. Leaping out, I walked up the steps and rang the bell, while the cab went on down the street. The maid who opened the door was trimmer than I had expected to find. The mistress of the lodging house, when she appeared, though a perfect mountain of flesh, gave signs of a very considerable intelligence. Yes, there were lodgings, a second and fourth floor front. Up the stairs panted and wheezed the stout landlady, while I followed in her train. On the fourth floor we halted and entered the small hall bedroom at the top of the stairs, I threw the window open and leaned out and looked up and down the street. Bad thing if a shutter fell from here, I said. Wasn't it in one of the houses near this that a shutter fell and injured a laborer a couple of months ago? The landlady seized my lead instantly. It was the right-hand shutter, she said, in the very window you're looking out of now. I bent eagerly to look at the hinges. They were brand new, while those on the other side were strained and worn through years of exposure to wind and sun and rain. "'You don't say,' I replied. "'Most interesting. "'I suppose the hinges rusted and broke?' "'No,' said the landlady. "'That was one of the queerest things about it. "'After the whole thing was over, "'I came to look at the place where the shutter fell. "'There was no trace of a hinge. "'It must have pulled right out of the brick. "'And when I went the next day to look at the shutters in the kitchen, "'the hinges, screws, and everything were gone, "'and I never saw the least trace of them from that day to this. "'We had the new shutter put up a week later.' What luck, I thought to myself, as I looked around over the adjoining housetops. Hit it first time trying. Somewhere behind those roofs lies the laboratory of the man who is trying to stop all war. I parted with the landlady, promising an early decision, and went in search of Tom and Dorothy. They left the carriage as I approached and hurried towards me. The iron of the shutter disappeared, I said significantly. Tom gave the long low whistle which always typified interest and surprise to him. "'You think the man's laboratory is somewhere near here, then?' asked Dorothy, excitedly. "'Judging by Hammerley's experience with the sign opposite Dr. Heidenmuller's laboratory, I certainly do,' I answered seriously. "'This probably happened just as that did.' "'Then,' said Tom, "'it's probably up to us to make a house-to-house -house canvas of the neighborhood. "'It looks to me as if the chances were better in one of the buildings on Tottenham Court Road "'than in any of the houses round here.' "'That's right.' 
i answered briefly tell you what we'll do we'll ask at every shop if they know of any chemical laboratory tell them we're hunting for a man who works in such a laboratory lay it on thick and give them plenty of detail that's the way to get the information you want i'll wait for you in the carriage round the corner dorothy called after us as we started away from bake shop to dairy from furniture store to shoe shop i traveled searching for some news of my poor cousin george who had worked in a laboratory somewhere near the corner of tottenham court road and gower street and who had disappeared persistently diplomatic i forced my way on under rebuff after rebuff leaving no store until i had a pretty vivid idea of the various occupations which made their home on every floor of its building as i left after receiving one particularly stinging answer i caught sight of tom across the street beckoning i followed him at a little distance until he turned a sharp corner into a little alley he appeared slightly dishevelled as he turned around see here he said abruptly i'm afraid we'll be run in if we keep this up much longer i've been in one row already had to knock a man down who made caustic remarks about sneak thieves what have you got hold of anyway i haven't got hold of a thing i responded well then said tom let's cast back and take another look at the topography just where the shutter fell back we went over the ground once more and stopped to examine cautiously the window with its green blind that's a fourth-story corner room said tom reflectively and the house next to it is only three stories why you blind man he went on suddenly only one side of the shutter fell so the attack couldn't have come from the front it must have come from the back of the house let's go round and see what is just behind this round the square we circumnavigated landing finally at a building some five stories high whose first story showed the shelves and cluttered window of a second-hand bookshop beside the shop a flight of stairs led to the upper stories no sign gave evidence of any business carried on above the first here goes for the bookshop said tom and we marched in a tall stooping youth of exaggerated height with lank and flaming red moustache came wearily forward stifling a cavernous yawn as he came we repeated our stock inquiry to him we were colonials from australia seeking our cousin george who worked in a laboratory did our friend with the red moustache know of any laboratory near a gleam of interest lighted the slightly watery eyes i don't know rightly whether it's a laboratory or not he began but there's some sort of a bloomin show occupies our whole fifth i've never been able to see inside of it yet you might try a shot at it all over we received the volley of misplaced aspirates with joyous hearts noting the gleam of avid curiosity in the watery eyes as the clerk thought of the mysterious laboratory on the top floor all he could tell was that the top floor had been let a few months before to a tall man with the usual vagueness of his type of mind that was as far as he could go over and over again he repeated the same indefinite phrase a tall man when the man moved in a couple of vans had brought strange furnishings a small furnace glassware and instrument cases a little while ago an assistant had appeared a foreigner who knew no english or at least refused to understand the language the two the man and his assistant often worked together till late at night sometimes the clerk believed they worked all night as for him he would have repeated the thing to the police he didn't believe in having mysteries like that around but his master the proprietor of the bookshop refused to part with regular paying tenants yes sir he'd try again and again to see what they were doing but there was a curtain over the door and you couldn't see anything through the keyhole the door was always locked so that the adventurous spirit of the clerk had to be content with imagining the horrible crimes perpetrated behind the curtain door this certainly looked good with anxious hearts tom and i started up the stairs in search once more of our cousin george halting however at the second story once the clerk was left safely behind it certainly looks like queer street anyway remarked tom reflectively it may be the man or it may be some bunch of counterfeiters or other criminals i'm not going to back down for a minute but i think one of us had better hunt up dorothy tell her where we are and have her put the police on the trail if we shouldn't happen to turn up tonight. strikes me that would be only an elementary precaution i'll do it i said you watch here before tom could object i was halfway down the stairs and out on the street on tottenham court road i found dorothy driving up and down she leaned forward questioningly as i jumped in i nodded in answer yes we got the place but we need your help now warned by experience as to its necessity 
I had mapped out my line of argument carefully as I hurried along. We have the very place, but we want you to stay outside and send us help if we should get into trouble. Dorothy's face fell. I want to go with you in the worst way. Yet I don't like the idea of you two going into danger without any outside assistance. What have you found out? It was no easy matter to convince her. Yet when Dorothy saw the condition of affairs, there was really nothing she could do but give in. For us to explore that unknown territory without some line on the outside to protect us in case of peril was manifestly unwise. Certainly it was not possible for us to let so plain a clue go by. At my command, the cabman drove past the old bookstore, up the street, and round the square. Back on the main thoroughfare again, I made ready to return and join Tom. You've got the place fixed clearly in mind? I asked, looking up at her from the sidewalk. To my surprise, Dorothy's eyes were filled with tears, and her voice came pleadingly. I wish you did not feel you had to go. I don't know why I feel so strangely about your going, but I do. Isn't there some other way out? I felt my resolution waning as an almost overmastering desire to seize her in my arms in the face of shocked and respectable Bloomsbury swept over me. We've got to follow the trail to the inn, Dorothy, I answered. Everything's going to be all right. Don't worry. As I turned away, I felt a light touch, almost like a caress, on my coat sleeve. Accident or not, no knight ever went into battle more inspired by his lady's gage than I. Bearing that accolade, strode towards the old bookshop in the mysterious laboratory on the fifth floor. Tom greeted me eagerly as I reached the second story. Not a sound from the laboratory, he began. And luck of lucks, there's an open, empty room opposite where we can wait. Come on up. Up the stairs and into the empty room we passed, pausing briefly to examine the blank and heavy door of the mysterious workers fastened by heavy locks. Our waiting place proved nothing more than a bare attic chamber, with a constricted view of roofs and chimney pots. Not exactly the abode of luxury, I said, glancing around critically. But then it's all in a day's work. I've waited in worse places for a lot smaller stakes. Folding his greatcoat for a cushion, Tom seated himself back against the wall. He had left the door a trace ajar. I'm practically sure that there's no one in there now, and we'll wait here till they arrive. But shall we be sure to hear them when they come up the stairs? By Jove, never thought of it. Not a thing to read with us. There's a bookshop downstairs. I wonder if I dare to try a sortie he thought for a moment. No, not yet, anyway. Tell you what I'll do. Here's a sporting proposition for you. He pulled out his penknife and opened it. Here's a bully bare floor. I'll play you a game of stick knife to while away the time. Nobody but an eternal boy like Tom would have conceived of a game of stick knife to while away the time of waiting before the mystery hidden by the blank face of the open door across the passage. Nobody but an eternal boy would have won so exasperatingly expert in all intricacies of the art tom had far outdistanced me as a knife juggler and i was lagging far in the rear when we heard the quiet closing of the door five stories below in an instant we were on our feet waiting for the ascending heavy footsteps tom's mobile face stiffened into rigid lines as he crouched poised beside the door while i stood ready to swing the door open and spring if necessary on the man who came as the footsteps halted on the landing before us, Tom bent towards me. The assistant, he whispered. Let him unlock the door and we'll push our way in with him. Everything happened in the twinkling of an eye. The jingle of keys, the slight creak of the opening door, then a sudden bound and we were across the hall and in an anteroom facing a bewildered man, evidently a Norwegian, whose blonde face was framed in flaxen hair and spade-shaped flaxen beard, and whose somewhat cow-like eyes peered out from spectacles of massive frame. He was clothed in a queer, straight-fronted, long blue sack coat with voluminous, almost sailor-like trousers. As he saw us standing on either side of him, he started back for a moment, but then stopped short, his keys still dangling from his hand. Pardon this somewhat sudden entrance, I said in my politest tone, but we are inspectors to visit the laboratory. A flood of unintelligible gutturals followed my statement. This was accompanied by vehement pointings at the door by which we had entered, and which was now closed, with Tom before it. I sat on the table, swinging my legs till the torrent passed. Then, as it died away, I walked boldly to one of the two doors on the opposite side to that which we entered, tried it, 
and then tried the other. Both were locked. Carefully watching the assistant's face, I pointed first at the keys still dangling forgotten in his hand, and then pointed at the first door I had tried, going to it and shaking the lock. To our surprise, the indignation in the man's countenance suddenly ceased. A mild acquiescence shone from behind his glasses, and going forward he unlocked the door, opened to a twilight behind, and went in. We stumbled in to the half-light, Tom closing the door behind us. As we entered, I tripped over a chair and fell headlong, throwing Tom, who was following. As I scrambled to my feet, a guttural laugh rang in my ears and a door slammed. There was a sound of bolts run home as I dashed forward, only to come headlong against a closed door. I rushed back to the door through which we had entered and shook it in vain, hearing to my bitter mortification a bolt running into its slide as I shook. A sound followed by another outburst of northern Teutonic glee. Foiled on both sides, I wheeled to look about me, and saw Tom already making a rapid investigation of the premises. We were in a small room, perhaps ten by twelve, surrounded by blank walls, save for openings made by the two doors on opposite sides. The only passage to the outer air was through an iron plate, perhaps nine inches by three feet, placed in the flat roof. In this were set small glass bullseyes, of the same type as those used to light basements from sidewalks. A couple of wooden stools made the only furnishings of the room. Tom turned to me at the end of his inspection and shook his head. I've made many a bad break in my life, he said regretfully, but coming in here after you and closing that door is the worst yet. That assistant with his fool face tricked me completely. Same here, I answered, but there's no use in wasting time talking about it. If there's any possible way to do it, we must be out of here before the man can notify the master. Right, said Tom. Let's try smashing our way out first by eight of these stools. In the pause that followed this proposal, we heard the heavy, slow step of the assistant cross the anteroom, heard the opening and the closing of the outer door. We were left alone. Good, said Tom. Now we can make all the noise we want to. Suiting the action to the word, he gave a mighty blow to the door with the wooden stool. The door stood like a rock, but the stool flew to pieces, the fragments of its seat narrowly missing me as they flew by. A well-made door, said Tom, reflectively. They don't have doors like that in most modern houses. As he spoke, he crossed the room to examine the door on the opposite side. Same staunch build, he remarked judicially. We couldn't be caged better outside of prison. I'm rather lighter than you, Jim, he went on. Let me get up on your shoulders and try this small roof window. He climbed up and in a minute or two came down again. Padlocked with an iron bar and staple from the outside, he said briefly. There's just one thing left to dig our way out with our knives through that solid oak door. I don't know, of course, whether we can do it or not, but I think it's the only alternative. That's one way, but not the only one, I said. One thing we can do first, put a signal out for Dorothy. How can you signal Dorothy? asked Tom. Break a hole in one of those glass bullseyes up there, I answered, and put a rung of the broken stool up through with my handkerchief tied on it. Good work, said Tom. Just the ticket. In two minutes, our flag of distress was waving on the roof. Now for the door, I cried, and we both set to work on the hard oak about the lock. British oak is proverbially tough. But that oak was the toughest that ever came out of Britain's primeval forests, I verily believe. When we had worked on it for what seemed like an endless time, we had but a slight furrow on either side of the lot, and two broken blades to show for our labors. Still, we kept doggedly on, chiseling and cutting little by little, till some impression really began to be made. At length, Tom straightened up painfully. That's back-breaking work, all right, he remarked with a groan. I never knew how much I sympathized with escaping prisoners till now. As we leaned against the wall, I heard a slight movement outside. Hush, I muttered. There's a sound. The noise grew louder. It was a key turning in the inside door. Then not one but three or four persons came hurriedly across the floor towards the door by which we had entered. Tom seized the whole stool and poised it ready to rush out, while I gripped a rung of the broken one. The bolt shot back, the key turned, the door swung open, and there, in the rectangle, stood Dorothy, Hammerly, the assistant who had imprisoned us, and an unknown elderly man. 
in a moment dorothy was in tom's arms but her hand groped for mine as she clung to him she sobbed only for a moment recovering herself almost as swiftly as she had broken down good work old girl said tom patting her i don't think frankly that i was ever so glad to see you in all my life as dorothy still with a slightly tremulous smile turned towards me tom gave his hand to hammerly how in blazes did dorothy do this trick anyway he asked i saw your signal of distress from the other side of the street broke in dorothy and i drove straight to the museum for one of our friends there i didn't want to bother with police if i could help it i met mr hammerly just where you met him before on the steps and just think this good man here is the bookshop man we met him as we came down to the door after trying the place so you and hammerly charged the lion's den alone did you i interrupted why of course said dorothy it's all due to her said hammerly no it's due to the assistants getting frightened said dorothy isn't it mr elder if you'd not been here miss haldane said the bookstore proprietor i never should have known what he was after i couldn't make out at all what kind of laboratory is this i asked determined not to be thrown off the scent the old man laughed i fancy my clerk must have been telling you some queer things i've never told him all i knew i don't mind keeping him wondering this is my brother's laboratory and as to what he does uh, look here he threw open the second door and we gazed in sets on sets of false teeth boxes of dentist supplies and dental machinery met our view i suddenly began to laugh tom looked at me for a moment and burst into peal on peal of laughter while the whole crowd even the assistant who had been gazing anxiously at us meanwhile finally joined in at last weak with laughter i asked why did the assistant shut us up he thought you were burglars explained the bookshop man and as my brother is out of town he ran for me my brother is a little careful whom he lets in as he does his main business in another place and this is a side affair and so the incident of the false teeth laboratory closed the outer air had never seemed so good to me save twice before when i left the new york prison in tom's motor car headed for dorothy and when i came up from the bottom of portsmouth harbor i took in long breaths of it as we walked towards the carriage and as we drove towards the hotel dorothy sat silent beside tom but every now and then i met her eyes and they fell the old look seemed gone there was a change a new and very sweet timidity tom drew a long breath a good night's sleep he said and we'll tackle clipping number three agreed said i agreed chimed in dorothy provided you'll take me with you but i won't go through another afternoon like this for anybody end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the man who ended war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the man who ended war by hollis godfrey chapter fifteen i was just dropping off to sleep that night when i heard a sharp rap at my door jumping up i opened it and tom rushed in i've just thought of something jim the hinges did disappear from that blind we struck the wrong house to-day but we mustn't give up on that account suppose you go back to the lodging-house in the morning and see if you can get any more light sure thing i answered but now for heaven's sake let me go to sleep of course said tom in an aggrieved tone but i thought you'd want to hear about that as soon as i struck it sure thing i repeated again only now i know about it go to bed and let me do the same my head touched the pillow as i heard the sound of the closing door and then i slept the clock around the next morning i started straight for bloomsbury to my destination of the morning before the lodging house my stout friend the landlady was out so the maid informed me but i could see the room again if i wished once on the top story i flung open the window and gazed about me the wilderness of brick was broken only by the waving boughs that kept this part of london from being quite the dreary waste that most modern cities are fast becoming or have long since become as i stood there striving to pierce the mystery the maid stood at a shambling attention in the doorway finally i turned 
i was very much interested in the story your mistress told me of the falling shutter i said slipping a half-crown into her ready fingers i should very much like to know if any part of the old shutter is by any chance in existence the maid's eyes glistened as she glanced surreptitiously at the coin in her hand rex down into washus she said you're from the coal pits or the mines i said smiling as i heard her dialect a dim flush showed in her sallow cheeks i'm from about there sir hast ever been there there's none like it i've been there i answered smiling again there's some fine men there her eyes lighted once more happen thou might like see the wreck canst if thou wish just what i would like i answered and the maid turned and clattered down the stairs down in the basement leaning against the wall beside some tubs was the wrecked shutter i brought it out to light the hinges were gone not a bit of iron showed upon it i turned to the silent maid queer thing where the hinges went i said questioningly no she replied she told box there yes i answered dot hot hinches michael took down today to shut her fall eagerly i bent over the rude wood box and examined the hinges carefully measuring them with my handkerchief and comparing the size with the lighter spots on the shutter which showed where the hinges had been there could be little doubt that what the girl said was true one doubt remained why did not your mistress know what became of the hinges i asked the mistress is rarely fogged and don't know many a thing goes on the maid explained but to a man that knows the coal pits she did not finish but i understood and a second half-crown lighter in purse i walked away all the way home the ludicrousness of our twenty-four-hour comedy of errors kept growing on me and i startled more than one passer-by with a sudden chuckle tom and dorothy sprung up in alarm as i entered and leaned against the wall weak with laughter are you hurt jim cried dorothy anxiously turning towards me no no i gasped but the disappearing iron hinge of the blind belongs in the same class as a dentist's laboratory michael put them on to wood box and to wash hoosh. that's where they disappeared to the fell beauty of the situation suddenly dawned upon tom's mind and he broke into inextinguishable laughter while dorothy her face lighting with glee joined in a moment later in silvery accord the adventure of the two young men and the young woman who hunted the disappearing shutter of bloomsbury ended with our mirth directly after lunch we started off towards chelsea up the embankment past the houses of parliament and the tate gallery by the broad stretches of chelsea hospital where a few old pensioners were sunning themselves on the trim walk our motor-car carried us to the very edges of the quaint old suburb our chauffeur had never heard of the street named in the clipping and it was only after diligent search that we found the little back street a mews where stables and kennels alternated with houses of stablemen and farriers where trig grooms in leggings the chrysalides and pompous coachmen in severe livery the full-grown moths met on equal terms at the end of the little street stood a small public-house for the benefit of the yahoos who congregated in the neighborhood as we passed it tom stopped the chauffeur i'll run in here he said and see what i can find in ten minutes he was back have you found anything queried dorothy leaning forward tom nodded we'll leave the car here he said laconically come on with me down the little street and through an inner court tom led the way at length he entered a gate whose rounding arch supported a quaint carved horse's head that might well have seen the equipages of a century or more ago lumbering beneath within was a square paved courtyard straight ahead a boarded stable on the right an old farrier's shop whose disused bellows and forge showed through a dusty window on the left a slatternly dwelling a sign on the stable in the shop stated the whole premises were to let inquire on the left of the yard hmm. they told me in the pub that the sign hung over the gateway with a carved horse's head said tom it was called the sign of the three horses i'm going to see if they know anything about it at the house dorothy and i waited by the gateway while tom crossed the yard as he advanced the door opened and a tall rectangular woman came out clothes pin in mouth and a piece of washing in her hands a somewhat one-sided conversation followed i want to see the stable for rent said tom mm, 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 responded the woman from her half-closed mouth i beg your pardon said tom but i don't quite understand 
another mumble followed as the woman right about faced and walked into the house tom cast a comical look at us that's what comes of not learning the language of the country you're going into he called in a loud aside i can talk german french or italian read latin and make a try at greek but i never studied a word of clothespin as he ended the woman reappeared still grasping the garment for the line but holding out as well two ponderous iron keys tom took them and turned to us simply remarking we'll look the place over loft stalls and cellar of the stable offered us nothing nor did we get more from the windows with their view of littered yards the old farrier's shop looked better tom thrust the ponderous key into the lock and threw back the heavy door right where the sun cast its gleam down the dusty floor lay a little pile of painted boards i sprang forward sliced animals i called to the others as i brought the six or seven old boards forward and began fitting them into place i had them sorted and arranged in a thrice bruised as they were by their fall the three horses heads on the signboard still showed clear though the dimming effect of time had dulled the flaring tints of the rude artist not a nail in it or a bit of iron though there were six nail holes to every board this can't be another wood box hinge case i remarked as we all bent eagerly over the sign a voice broke in on us that sign nearly cost us a pretty penny we straightened up quickly in the doorway stood a stout red-whiskered man i'm the agent for the property he said i heard you were looking it over so i came across we're ready to put it in good shape for any desirable tenant there's few better stable properties in the chelsea mews really said tom i'm not sure whether this will meet my needs or not we've just been looking things over and came upon this sign it must have received a pretty severe blow for every screw is out of it well sir said the agent eagerly that's the very strangest thing i ever saw i saw the sign go down i was just across the yard here in that corner and i happened to be looking out through the archway there was no wind not a breath of air stirring and yet all of a sudden the old sign tumbled a man had gone by not a minute before it might just as well hit him as not or hit me for that matter and the pole that held it and the nails and hinges and everything must have flown out of it when it struck at least i don't see what else could have happened to em they weren't there when i came along and they were good iron too i looked that sign over myself inside of two months to make sure things were all right our voluble friend stopped for breath as tom addressed him i spoke in an aside to dorothy i always supposed years ago that the english were the most silent race on earth but i'm finding out my mistake now it's the upper classes that are silent and the country people your londoner can talk a blue streak once he gets going tom had stepped out into the yard with the agent to give us a further chance to look over the sign and we were just about to make another examination of the nail holes when tom sung out to us come out here will you out we came to see the agent hurrying away and tom with keen hand ready to lock up i really believe we've got something this time he said in a low voice it seems this chap is an understrapper of the agent of the duke of moir who owns all this property about here he tells me that he let three rooms to a man named cragent who occupied them as a workshop or a laboratory off and on for some months and left about two days ago sometimes he'd be gone for months at a time the man's gone off for the keys now he's going to let us through the place he tells me that cragent probably made some changes though he hasn't been inside the place yet tom ended the agent returned with the keys and we followed on just beyond the mews on the adjoining street the agent mounted some stairs beside a little bake shop the red-whiskered man slipped a key in the lock and threw open the door eagerly we pressed in the bare room showed some slight litter left by their former occupant wrapping paper broken bits of insulated wire a shelf which showed behind it heavy disconnected wires which must have led to a motor generator a sink with a high goose neck tap it was a laboratory all right i said to dorothy who nodded and passed by into the third room she crossed directly to the rear window look here jim she called softly tom and the agent were left behind in the large center room i followed dorothy's pointing finger with my eyes as i reached her side there between the buildings showed a narrow open strip which ended in the shadow of a dark arch crowned by a rudely carved horse's head 
it was the arch where the sign of the three horses had hung if this was the man's laboratory his destructive power could have escaped from this window murmured dorothy gone straight through and attacked that sign without meeting iron anywhere else on the way oh jim do you suppose this room corresponded to dr heidenmuller's wooden room the man might have wooden panels to the windows and a double door and taken them down when he left i shook my head if enough of that deadly stuff got away to destroy the iron of the sign it would destroy every nail inside the room and here are iron nails holding the window casing together that's right said dorothy as she inspected the nail heads those do look like iron nails then she broke square off got your knife in your pocket jim silently i produced and opened it now try to pry out that nail she commanded pointing to one on the window casing i obeyed with the full expectation of breaking my knife short off to my utter surprise the blade cut straight through the nail with less resistance than the wood around it offered the nail head was shorn away dorothy and i sprang at the same moment to pick it up and we met in sudden collision only by the extraordinary presence of mind which i showed in clasping dorothy closely in my arms was a complete spill averted a soft tendril of the sweet spring woods swept my cheek the velvet petal of a flower brushed by my lips and my whole body was aflame scarcely the fraction of a second was dorothy in my arms yet it seemed as if eons of life had passed as we scrambled to our feet i could feel my face blazing i looked at dorothy her face was as suffused as mine felt just then tom entered and stood gazing at us with a quizzical smile head-on collision he exclaimed in mock alarm another big accident not a word did dorothy reply to his badinage she walked in an especially stately fashion to the window and stood gazing out while i busied myself energetically in hunting once more for the end of the nail which my knife had shorn off it was lying just by my side and as i picked it up it crumbled why these nail heads are putty i cried in amazement they're simply imitations of nails in a minute tom's knife was in his hand and quite forgetting everything else he was hacking away at a point where another nail head showed putty on top to represent an old nail head and wooden peg doing the business below he ejaculated i don't believe there's a bit of iron in the place tom dug at nail head after nail head and each flew off dorothy it's a wooden room he cried oh really said dorothy in an entirely lifeless monotone and there is the horse's head out of that window you must have been blind not to have seen it before we did see it i said testily but you're so confoundedly impetuous you rush ahead before anybody can tell you anything tom paid but slight attention to my remarks he was up on a window sill prying with his knife i've got it he exclaimed finally in triumph here's the place where they hung the wooden shutters on with wooden pegs and they painted and puttied them over when they took the panels down he leapt down and started towards the other room i'm going to find out what the agent knows he called back over his shoulder dorothy stood still by the window the late afternoon sun making a golden halo of her somewhat rumpled hair as i watched her there seemed to be something a trace less energetic in her posture she was leaning against the window and gazing fixedly outward she did not notice me at all for ten minutes we remained in a silence broken only when tom returned waving a dirty piece of paper triumphantly the agent didn't know where the chap had gone he cried but i've got a line on him anyway here's the address of a dealer in electrical supplies left in a corner on a scrap of paper we'll drive straight to the city and look him up down the embankment the way we came past the savoy and the temple through queen victoria street and by the bank to bishopsgate street we ran dorothy sat beside me on the rear seat of the car tom next to the driver all the way in she gave me hardly a word scarcely replied to tom's occasional chatter i had never seen her tongue so strangely silent her cheek so blushed with the morning crimson nor had i ever seen her eyes more deeply thoughtful more softly beautiful we drew up before the supply store and tom hurried in followed by dorothy and myself he wanted some wire of the same type as that last ordered by mr Crajan. could they look up the order and let him have it certainly no difficulty at all the clerk went back to examine the order book and i followed by his side 
in the little dingy office at the rear stood a high desk with the tall books above in an ordered row down came c cragent page one sixteen said the index as the clerk turned to the page i glanced over his shoulder mr h cragent the chelsea address was crossed out with a line written below were the words nine cheapside that was all i wanted i nodded to tom as he gave a hurried order for the wire and we were free for the new address this is the right one said dorothy quietly as we left the shop how do you know asked tom it looks good i'll admit but i don't see how you can tell i don't know how i can tell answered dorothy in low tones but i feel sure this time as i haven't before in ten minutes we were at the corner nearest to the new address had left the car and were walking up the busy street the sign above the door at nine cheapside proclaimed a haberdasher's shop within the second story showed a dealer in notions and the third and fourth held no signs there are leads from the power circuit running into that fourth story said tom as we passed here's the door no business cards for anything above the second come on let's try next door up the stairs by a milliner's shop past the third story to the fourth we climbed a wing ran back with a gallery that opened on one side at the rear was a short flight of steps with a scuttle at the top which opened out onto the roof by good fortune this was unlocked and we climbed through out on the flat roof into the maze of chimneys tom was a little ahead and reached the parapet on the side of number nine while we were still at the scuttle as he turned to the edge he wheeled and beckoned to us expressively we hurried forward below on the fourth story three shuttered windows faced us in the centre one the wind had blown half the blind open behind it we gazed on a solid wooden panel which filled the window from top to bottom from side to side behind the glass an exact duplicate of the window panels of heidenmuller's wooden room i whispered tom and dorothy nodded silently End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of The Man Who Ended War」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter 16 Quietly we drew back from the parapet, and closing the scuttle behind us, started down the narrow stairs. At their base, Dorothy stopped suddenly. As Tom came up, he noticed her delay and paused with his hand on the latch. "'What is it, girl?' he asked, almost tenderly. "'You think we ought to go on, do you?' asked Dorothy, hesitatingly. "'Of course we're going on,' said Tom. "'There's no question about it. That's what we're here for. What's the matter, anyway?' "'Frankly, I don't know,' said Dorothy slowly. If we come through this all right, I'll try never to say a word again, but somehow, somehow... She broke off without finishing. Cheer up, old girl, comforted Tom, putting his arm about her waist. What should we do without your valiant spirit? I stood there mute. This was a new Dorothy, a silent, questioning woman different from the one I knew, and yet like her. I could not seem to collect my scattered wits enough to be of any service. With an effort, Dorothy squared her shoulders, come on she said firmly and we started out for the door tom and i a couple of steps behind good for you i whispered as we turned in beside the haberdasher shop and started up the stairs at whose top we were forced to believe stood the laboratory of the man we sought the workshop of the man who was trying to stop all war as we reached the second landing tom turned to me this is the queerest mixture of fireproof and fire trap i've ever heard of he ejaculated iron stairs and wooden landings with two doors on each side wonder if it keeps on like this all the way up it did iron stairs and wooden landings succeeded each other till the fourth story showed two doors one on either side of a landing dimly illuminated by a skylight it's one of the two whispered tom he tried one door softly locked tried the other to my surprise it opened and a bare room much like that where tom and i had waited through the weary hours in bloomsbury met our view just at that moment we heard a footstep clang on the iron stair below 
and around the bend the handle of a broom came into sight, followed by an arm clad in the sleeve of a coarse jumper. The janitor halted in amazement as he saw our phalanx of three standing in the empty room. Before he could open his mouth, I addressed him. "'I want to rent this room,' I said. "'It suits me in many ways. What's the rent?' "'For a pund a month, sir.' "'Thank you,' came the answer. "'Anybody else on this same story?' I asked. "'Just uh, Mr. Cragent, thank you, sir, who has a workshop across the way. "'He's out for good today, but he's been in and out quite a bit the few days he's been here. "'Thank you, sir. I think he'll make you no trouble, sir.' I looked at Tom and Dorothy, who signed affirmatively. "'I'll take it,' I said. "'Shall I have to see the agent?' "'No, sir, thank you,' answered the man. "'I'm the acting agent for this one building. "'Very well, then. Here you are.' I handed over four pounds for the first month's rent and turned back to survey my new-found quarters more carefully. It was evidently one of two front rooms looking out on the street. The other front room, with the rooms in the wing which stretched back, must belong to the mysterious Cragent. Sullied with fog and smoke, our place was a typical London office, whose grey marble mantle and grate was the only relief to the naked walls. The janitor, without a sign of wonder at our sudden invasion of his premises, turned with his broom and clanged down the iron stairs. Tom and Dorothy and I went inside and nearly closed the door, leaving it open a crack for the purpose of observation. As long as we may have to be here off and on for a week or more, we may just as well be comfortable about it, said Tom in a low tone. Two of us can stay here while the other one goes and gets some chairs and a little coal. You and Dorothy keep on the lookout while I get enough furnishings to make us comfortable for a few hours. Sure thing, I said, my heart leaping at the chance of a short tete-a-tete -tete with Dorothy. I'm going with you, Tom, said Dorothy. Jim can watch alone, all right. And she started out on the landing ahead of her brother. Tom threw one glance at me. See you shortly, he said, and followed. I resumed my place of watching. Half an hour passed, and Tom and Dorothy were back with porters, carrying a table, chairs, and coal. In ten minutes after their arrival, there was a brisk fire in the grate, we were comfortably disposed about it, and the porters had departed. Dorothy sat gazing into the fire, with the same dreamy quiet which had so characterized her appearance for the last few days. I sat watching Dorothy, and Tom was busy lighting his pipe. Suddenly I heard a slight and repeated noise. With a sign to Tom, I rose and tiptoed to the door. There was no one coming up. I went to the landing and listened. No more result. Yet I had surely heard footsteps. I went back into the room and closed the door. Tom was beside me in a moment, pipe in hand. But as I cast a hurried glance about me, I saw that Dorothy had not stirred. She still sat, her head on her hand, gazing into the glowing coals. The footsteps were louder now, and I went to one boundary wall and then to another. There was someone pacing up and down in Cragent's rooms. Tom was beside me as I bent to listen, his face the picture of eagerness. "'There must have been someone in there all the time,' I whispered. "'But if there was, I should have thought he would have been disturbed by our moving in, and would have come out.' "'The janitor told me that Cragent had not come in, and that there was no one working with him,' muttered Tom. "'I don't see through it.' Back and forth went the steps. Tom put his pipe in his mouth and began smoking with long, regular puffs. "'I believe there's another entrance to these rooms.' he said finally. I'm going out to reconnoiter. Silently and carefully he tiptoed out, without Dorothy's knowing of his departure. I brought my chair over near the wall and sat down to wait. A hush followed, broken only by the incessant low roar of the city, that roar which to the attentive ear in its deep, firm bass is wholly differentiated from the shrill staccato of New York, the lower, swifter tones of Paris, or the middle-toned, ordered hum of Berlin. On the other side of the wall, the steps went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, turn, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, turn. On and on, with unvarying regularity, marched the heavy, thrusting step that reverberated over the old floor. Dorothy sat motionless her eyes still fixed upon the fire, oblivious to the world, her soft hair contrasting with the rich fur of her coat lying draped over the back of an old chair. I heard the slow creak of an opening door and went softly toward a beckoning arm in gray. I won't come in, whispered Tom excitedly. I've got the trick. There's another entrance to his rooms. 
we'll cage him between us and get a good look at him anyway. There's a little office corresponding to this on the other side where I can wait. You stay by the bay window and watch for me. If he comes my way, wave to me. If he comes yours, I'll wave to you. Gee, I haven't had more fun for an age. Off Tom traveled, down the stairs, walking with an exaggerated caution, and I turned in, smiling. Dorothy had not roused at the interruption. I began to worry a bit about this strange abstractedness. Could she be quite well? No, that was quite foolish, for she seemed the picture of health. Then the footsteps took my attention for a moment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Turn and repeat. It was like the trampling of feet in the tale of two cities. The single footstep seemed to swell into a roar of charging troops. Was this walker the man who was trying to stop all war? Were the footsteps above and around those of the thousands he had slain, or that he was to slay? Were we marching among the ghostly shades of the future? Were we in that crowding throng? What dreadful mystery lay behind the wooden panels of those windows? I fell to speculating on the appearance of the stranger behind the wall, and always the form of the man who was trying to stop all war took on the slight graceful form of a southerner, and the face was the clear swarthy face of Regnier. Try as I might, I could not give the shadowy man we pursued any other face or form. The footsteps went on and on. Dorothy aroused. Where's Tom? she said, looking around. He's away for a moment, I said slightly mendaciously. He'll be back shortly. He ought to have told me he was going, she said a little impatiently. But her reverie proved too strong for her to escape, and she sank back into a dreamy abstraction. The twilight began to come down as we sat watching, and as I listened. As it fell, the fire's rose played yet more softly on Dorothy's beautiful hands lying on the arm of her chair, showed a bit of rounded cheek and a translucent shell-like ear. Gradually I forgot my whole mission. The man became a ghost and faded silently away. Tom, waiting on tiptoe in the office next door, was quite forgotten. Dorothy and I and the fire. This new Dorothy, dreamy, quiet, almost clinging, with those new depths in her eyes, was carrying me quite beyond myself. Dorothy, I said in a low voice. Dorothy, she turned. What is it, Jim? I tried to speak, but I could not. The rushing words overwhelmed me. I could not make myself intelligible, and I sat there shivering with the intensity of my feelings, and yet unable to say what I wished. I found my voice again. Dorothy, I began. I want to tell you. Dorothy's eyes met mine for a moment, and then her long lashes fell. I've been thinking, she stammered. Thinking, thinking, I bent forward eagerly, of our old home on Long Island Sound. The words came with a rush, as if she had just seized them from the air. You never went down there, but it's the loveliest place, she went on hurriedly. The sea in a great crescent bay, paved with the whitest sand, and an old colonial house on a little rise. She was talking at top speed now. But, Dorothy, I broke in, I want you to know... She gave me no chance to finish. Tom has a laboratory that he has fitted up down by the shore, she went on still more swiftly the words fairly tumbling over each other and we work there when we're not off on the black arrow when we get back i'm going straight down i want to see the place so badly dorothy i began again oh and did you see the account of the reception at the ambassadors said dorothy as hastily as before they had the whole thing twisted upside down names all tangled up they got tom's name as professor thomas orrington and you as james she stopped short how did they get yours i asked eagerly did you see that they are tearing up the embankment down by the obelisk was the extremely pertinent reply as all three of us had spent a quarter of an hour a day or two before watching those same operations it seemed probable that i had seen them but dorothy i pleaded just a minute i want to dorothy sprung from her chair and started for the door I i'm going to find tom she said stop i called in a low voice the man is on the other side of the partition, walking up and down. Listen. Dorothy stood still for a moment in the very poise of flight, and we both listened intently. The roar of the city was the only sound. The measured footsteps had ceased. When they had stopped, I had no idea. I had proved an unfaithful watcher. 
then for heaven's sake where's tom i cried as i rushed to the window dorothy surprised from her attitude followed me i gazed from the window up and down the house fronts and street tom was nowhere in sight dorothy leaned forward beside me to look out and in the intoxication of her immediate presence every idea beside my wish to tell her of my love was swept away i seized her hand dorothy i exclaimed you must and shall hear what i am going to say her hand at first fluttered in striving to escape gave up its struggle and she stood silent listening with averted head dorothy i began again at that very moment the door flew open and tom red and breathless dashed into the room dorothy sprang towards him like a startled fawn and i was left with outstretched hand the modern tantalus of london tom was too excited to notice our positions well i must say you're a pretty pair he exclaimed all this work and trouble gone for nothing because you wouldn't take a little bit of care at the end you call yourself a newspaper man there's only one department you can handle and that's the obituary column what's the matter i asked coming down to earth matter cried tom disgustedly the whole thing's up so far as this clue is concerned and we've got to start in all over again i've seen the man and if you had been even reasonably alert you'd have seen him too and we would have had him trapped you've seen the man are you sure asked dorothy breathlessly tom nodded gravely i have and i think for some reason that he knew me he answered more slowly when i left you i went over to the office on the other side and waited i just sat where i could see if anyone opened on my side i had been there perhaps half an hour when the door opened and a man in a slouch hat whose face was hidden in the dim twilight of the hall stepped out just as he caught sight of me he jumped back and locked the door that's the time for jim i said to myself and ran to the window and waved i could have waved my arm off i believe and you would never have known it so when i realized that i hurried down and over to these stairs on the third flight i heard steps coming down the fourth i came up very softly and there just ascending was the man in the slouch hat when he saw me he threw up his arm across his face said what sounded to me like you again and backed away into the darkness of the corner i followed but before i could reach him a door behind him flew open and he dashed through slamming it in my face i flew against the door and it gave by the time i was in the room he was across it and out the other door i followed him down the stairs but lost him in the street if you people had been half decently on the watch we'd have had something but now he knows we're after him and he'll simply disappear from here but i believe i've seen that chap somewhere before there was a queer familiarity about him and what did he mean by you again it's barely possible that your old theory may be right jim or it may be that you have driven regnier so into my head that i look to find him in a man i don't know at all well i know said dorothy with a sudden reversion to her old independent spirit it isn't but how did the man happen to have keys in his hand for those doors on the story below i don't understand that i don't know i'm sure said tom i was in too much of a hurry to get at the chap to pay any attention to the way he unlocked the doors of course there is a bare chance that the fellow may be a harmless citizen who mistook me for either a highwayman or a lunatic not with the wooden panels on the windows said dorothy let's go down and look at the doors regretfully i locked the door and left the bright fire and bare-walled room where dorothy had come so near to listening to me i was disappointed of course i was disappointed at my carelessness in losing the man i sought but dorothy's hand had lain in mine without struggling in that last instant of time before tom came in there was some balm in gilead yet delays are dangerous and i felt i must not lose time in following up any advantage gained as i turned the corner of the stairs i heard a low exclamation from dorothy and tom's expressive whistle they were bending over an open door examining the lock with a match which tom held shielded between his palms as i joined them tom pointed without comment at the place where the lock had been its bare wood showed lighter surfaces as the signs had showed the marks of the handiwork of the man and nail holes that told of disappearing metal how's that for a picklock said tom the other one was opened in just the same way cragent is the man and i saw him but i couldn't reach him what a control he must have over his instrument to be able to destroy a battleship and open the lock of a door by means of disappearing metal dorothy shuddered 
it's dark here and cold i want to go back to the hotel she said a little tremulously i'll be all right in the morning and i'll go with you after the man but now i'm tired tired i think the horror of the thing shadowed us all a bit in that gloomy old london house the darkness of the corners the man who had slain so many of his fellow men separated from us by a single partition seemed gruesome and deadening those footsteps pacing up and down did they mean more slaughter new inventions was the mysterious man whom we had sought the familiar figure tom had imagined and dominating thought of all did dorothy's hand rest in mine without struggling that last moment there was enough to keep my thoughts at work on the way home even though dorothy persistently gazed from the window of the four-wheeler and uttered never a word as we left the carriage tom broke silence if you feel like it jim i think it wouldn't be a bad plan to look up hammerly tonight and see what he says to all this a good idea i said i'll get a hasty bite and run up there no use in wasting time all right said tom and dorothy as we parted gave me one shy glance that sent me away in a golden maze of joy and hope hammerly was out when i arrived at his lodgings called away suddenly for a couple of days the maid reported on my way back however i came to one very definite conclusion hammerly must have seen the man face to face in dr heidenmuller's laboratory he could settle one vexed question anyway i was going to find a picture of regnier if there was one to be had i reached the savoy to find word from tom that he and dorothy had gone over to the cecil to see some friends i followed leaving word at the office that i had gone as i stood in the corridor waiting a page came by calling my name for the telephone i took up the receiver with a deep thrill of anticipation orrington yes it was one of her correspondents war just declared between england and germany i have inside information that the fleets will meet in the channel tomorrow off dover i suppose you'll hunt your man there i'm off for the scene of battle by the first train i answered much obliged and i hung up the receiver as i stepped out under the great awning at the head of the courtyard the gaiety and life of the full tide of evening was sweeping through beautifully dressed women gallant men life and youth and pleasure and tomorrow what would a single one of those mighty ships would one of those brave sailors return as i stood there a hush came the news which i had heard had just been received then came a mighty roar war 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 then as it died away out burst a great increasing wave of song the whole multitude joining in one mighty chorus god save the king i saw dorothy hastening towards me her lips quivering jim have you got to go to sea she said stammering i'm so afraid no boat will ever return and she ended with a sob i could wait no longer dear love i said i must but i love you dear and if i die to-morrow or fifty years off i love you and you alone and there as the last bars of the song rang forth in the full tide of exultation as the clamor of the crowded street outside rose to its height dorothy and i came to our own end of chapter sixteen